أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار I want to welcome uh, Dr. Shafiq here, Abu Adam, his boy Adam. They were part of the reason why we haven't given a number of lessons here in the last three weeks, I think in the month of April. This is the first and last lesson that I'll be giving in the month of April because I traveled. Traveled to Malaysia where I met Dr. Shafiq and his boy. And today I came, I prayed, and I said, Salaamu Alaikum, Salaamu Alaikum, and I saw him coming. I thought it was some type of optical illusion. So we welcome you to Green Lane Masjid, and may Allah Azza wa allow your stay here in Birmingham in the UK to be one in which he is pleased with you and your family. May he divinely protect you guys. Today, inshallah, I want to encourage you and bring your attention to an issue. We're going to suspend the class of the Shema'il al-Muhammadiyya of al-Imam al-Tirmidhi. It's to encourage you about a very important issue, a sunnah from the sunan that the people have made hajr of it, abandoned it for the most part. Many people even who claim a connection to the sunnah or trying to practice the sunnah this thing is lost amongst many of us, although it has a lot of benefit as far as our health is concerned, as all of the sunnah is going to bring some benefit for you in the deen, in the dunya, and the akhirah. As we mentioned many times, and everyone that has to believe this, buy into it, it's the fact that the deen of Allah is complete and it is sufficient for us in every aspect of our lives. We still see so-called Islamic experts getting on TV, getting on the radio, talking about the religion of Islam, and they don't know what they're talking about. We see people writing about the deen, speaking about the deen, and they have doubt about the reality of Islam. Has this religion been completed or not? Allah Ta'ala has sent his Prophet وسلم, with a religion that is mutakamil, mutashamil, is complete from all angles. I completed for you your religion. Our deen is not in need of anybody introducing anything to it or subtracting from it. Your Lord didn't forget anything. The other day, 27th night of Rajab, Muslims in Birmingham, London, Muslims all over the world, they were celebrating Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. And although Al-Isra wal Mi'raj had happened, we don't know when it happened. Just as we don't know that the Prophet Sallallahu we know that he was born, but we don't know when it happened. So the people who did all of those prayers and all of those dhikr from the people of Al-Hawa, it's as if and Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forgot to tell the people, do this on this special night. It required people who came later to come and figure out this is something that we should do because Abu Qasim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forgot to explain that to us. La. He brought a religion that is complete, religion for everyone. Qul ya nas inni rasulullahi ilaykum jami'ah. Tell the people, Ya Muhammad, I'm the messenger of Allah to all of you. I'm not just for the Arabs. I'm not just for the poor or the rich, men or the women. 
I came with a religion for everybody. And not only for human beings, but for the jinn as well. The Prophet وسلم, brought a religion, didn't leave anything out. Sanman al Farisi, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the companions, when we used to sit with the Prophet, وسلم, he would just give us information about things that were happening. If a bird flew, he told us about the bird's flight, about everything we needed to know about that bird. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he was with a man. The man sneezed. And after sneezing, he said the sunnah, the dhikr, alhamdulillah. And then he added on to that and he said, was salatu was salamu ala rasulillah. Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with me, he said, I also say was salatu was salam on rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but not at this time, not at this place. After sneezing, he didn't bring that as our religion, so why are you adding on to it? Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. He narrated that hadith that al Imam and know we put in his book 40 hadith. It's in Bukhari and Muslim. Second hadith, Buni al Islam wa ala khams. Islam has been built upon five things, and then he mentioned the five pillars of al Islam. So, after mentioning these five pillars of Islam, a man who was sitting there said, Wal jihad, fi What about jihad? Like some of the people who are living today, these people have ghulu in jihad, only if they understood jihad, had fiqh of jihad, comprehension of jihad. This man, he heard that Islam is built upon the shahadatain, the salah, the zakat, the sawm, the hajj. The man added on and said, and jihad? Abdullah ibn Umar said, Al-Jihad is good, but what I just said is what the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these five things. So don't add on number six or seven. So the Muslim has to be content with knowing, believing, understanding. This deen is complete. and We are not in need of adding anything. So the deen spoke about everything that we need to know. And one of the things it dealt with in detail is how to keep good health and how to maintain good health. And there's only one aspect of the health that I want to deal with today, but the point is the dean came and it taught us everything we need to know, touched upon everything we need to know. As it relates to health, when a child is born, we know the ahkam of the aqiqa. You only do about four, four things, that's it. And what you do not do is, you don't make the adhan in the right ear or the iqam in the left ear because it's not established. Both of those hadith are weak. Now, because it's a common practice amongst the people, if you came to a community and you said, don't do the adhan in the right ear, don't do the iqam in the left ear, people get upset. Why? Because we've been doing it forever. As I told you, doing it forever doesn't mean anything. Did it come from the Prophet Wasallam? Even if I did it for all of my kids, I find out today this thing is weak. I said, alhamdulillah, I know it's weak. Now I'm not going to call to it. I'm not going to deal with it. But there are those people who have a problem. That it could be, and no hum karihu ma Allah. Some people have a problem with it because they want to do it. Anyway, the point is, he told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-ghulam rahinun bi-aqiqatihi. أَحْرِيقُوا عَنْهُ دَمًا وَمِيتُوا عَنْهُ الْأَذَى Every child is hostage. He's held ransom until his aqiqah is done. And for that reason, many of the ulama said that the aqiqah is wajiba. He said every child is, he's a captive. He's a ransom until the aqiqah is done. He says, so you make sure after seven days, that you slaughter an animal for him and you cut his hair and take the harm off of him. So in the beginning of the life of the individual, he's a brand spanking new baby, came out of his mother's stomach, brand spanking new. The religion brought things to us to tell us, hey, watch out for the health of the child. Inside of the womb, that hair was beneficial. Outside of the womb, the hair of the boy or the girl is harmful. So it's a delil and an example of how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's religion 
taught us everything we need to know about our health. Those of us who are sick, he mentions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la tukrihu mardakum ala ta'am, finna allaha yut'imuhum wa yusqihim. If you are taking care of someone who's sick, your relative, someone's sick, he said, don't force them to eat. If they don't want to eat, they don't have an appetite, don't force them. Don't keep telling them, you got to eat, you got to eat. He said, verily, Allah will feed them and Allah will give them to drink. So forcing a person who's sick to eat can possibly harm him. So for that reason, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that. So everything we need to know, everything. ما أنزل الله داء إلا أنزل معه دواء Allah never sent down any disease except along with that disease he sent down the cure he said but there's no cure for al-haram for getting old there's no cure for getting old there's nothing that can change that process which helps us to understand especially you younger brothers because as we grow up and we're young we hear a lot of khurafat on TV about the fountain of youth. That fountain of youth is kebab, khurafat. You can't go back in time. It's not something that happens. So every disease has its cure. Every disease, except the cure of old age and death. That's it. So that is an example of Khwani and just so many things that he mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he has given us some things to take care of, and this is the point. Many of us, have drink Zamzam water, and we never even went to Umrah or Hajj. But where we see, and when we see Zamzam water at a friend's house, at a store, we'll buy it, and we'll make a dua because of the hadith, Zamzam lima shuri balahu. Zamzam is what you drink it for. It has medicinal value by Allah's permission. So we believe that and we'll drink it. Many of us have taken honey. I think all of us have taken honey with the goal and the objective and the purpose and the niyyah of getting shifa bi idhnillah. Because it's from the sunnah. Habbata soda. I think most of us have taken that. The habbata soda oil even. People put it in their beard. People put it on their body. Okay, got eczema. They put the, the habbata soda, the zayt of it, on their child. So there are many things he told us. Like the thing for the kuhl. He told the people to take the kuhl that is called al-ithmid. Because if you take this type of kuhl, the black stuff that go in, in your eyes, he said that this will strengthen your ability to see. Now the Muslim with iman, he's not going to not go to the optometrist and get his eyes checked because he may need glasses. But this type of hadith, he'll use that thing because he know that the Prophet Sallallahu said it. And Allah said about him, Ya ayyul ladhina aminu stajibu lillahi wa rasul. Ida da'akum lima yuhyikum. Answer the call of Allah and his messenger when they invite you to that which will give you life. Like these many things. And they are many. He taught us that the milk of the cow has medicine in it. The fat of the cow has medicine in it. But the meat of the cow has a disease in it. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had some companions who came. Their stomachs were bloated. Their eyes were bulging. They lost the color in their faces because they were sick in al Medina. He said, go and drink the urine of the camel. So they went and they mixed the urine and the halib of the camel and they drank it. And they became well by Allah's permission. I see that... Shafiq grabbed his boy after we mentioned the urine and the halib of the camel. We're not, gonna, we're not going to make you guys drink any. Uh, don't worry. Because I told him when he came to the UK, I'm going to slaughter camel for him. So now I'm talking about urine and, urine and uh, milk of the camel, and he starts to hold his boy. I was in Kenya recently. I went to the house of a, kern, a colonel, really nice man, mashallah. And he gave us some fresh camel's milk. And I drank it, and it was nice. But I shouldn't have drank it, and I had to take the plane the next day. So these types of things are not from our culture. But still, although they're not from our culture, our environment, the Prophet said it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the people of Iman, they don't have any problem with it. So anyway, many of these issues, ikhwani, 
They are in our religion and they're there for us. And again, I want to advise you to get the book, Atib al Nabawi by Imam Ibn Qayyim. It's in English. It's one of the books that you should give someone who's getting married. It's one of the books that you should give for your wife so the wife can read it. Because in it are many issues that were mentioned from the Quran and the Sunnah, helping us to come to do those things that are going to benefit us. But what I want to encourage you with and bring to your attention is this issue of the hijama, the issue of al-hijama. The hijama is a virtuous sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we're going to drink zamzam water and take honey, you should know that the hijama was considered to be better than everything else as it relates to the prophetic medicines. It's number one on the top of the list. And the hijama is when you go to a hajim, a person, he puts some holes on you, you know, pricks you with a razor or something, and then he takes a cup. That's how they used to do it, but now it's more technology involved. They put that on you, and it takes out the bad blood. The Prophet وسلم, did it on his head right here. He did it on the side of his neck right here. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did it between his two shoulders back here. His wife, Umm Salama radiallahu anha, became sick. So the Prophet وسلم, told a man his kunya was Abu Tayyiba. Oh, Abu Tiba, do this to Umm Salama and give her the hijama. Some of the ulama said, that was Abu Sal um Salama's brother from Sakling. So he did the hijama on her. And he did the hijama on the Nabi. And Rasulullah gave him something for doing the hijama. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how do we know and why do we say that the hijama is better than everything else? Why do the ulama say that? Because of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. He mentioned an authentic hadith, Akhbarani Jibril, in al hajam anfa'u ma tadawa bih nas. He said that Jibril told me that the most beneficial medication that people use is the hijama. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, amfalu ma tadawaytum bihi al hijama. Amthalu. He said the best thing, amthal, the most perfect thing that you people can take medicine from, it is the hijama. In that hadith he said amthal, and another hadith he said afdal, the best thing. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, ma marartu bi mala'in min al mala'ika laylat usri abiyya illa qalu li ya Muhammad alayka bil hijamati. He said, when I went to Al-Isra wal miraj and we don't know, Akhi, when Al-Isra wal miraj was, but it was a miraculous issue that was mentioned in the Quran, Surat Al-Isra. He said, when I went to this thing on this journey, I never went by or past a group of angels, except that those angels said, Ya Muhammad, you should do the hijama. And part of what happened in that incident Al Isra al Miraj, Allah mentioned in the Quran, Li Yuriyahu min ayatihi. Subhanallah, Asra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al haram in al masjid al aqsa. In the end of that ayat, Allah said that He wanted to show the Prophet from the signs. He saw some miraculous signs. The Barak that He rode the miracle of traveling, the speed of light, going to Beit al-Maqdis and praying with all of the prophets and the messengers, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim, going up and seeing the different prophets and messengers on the different levels in the Jannah, going all the way to the Sidr al-Muntaha, where even Jibril didn't go. So in that trip, Allah showed them many ayat. From those ayat is that every time he passed a group of malaika, they said, Ya Muhammad, take the hijama. This is an ayat from the ayat of Al-Islam. From the ayat, when he went on that trip, is this prayer. The five prayers were given to us. Tremendous ayat. The shahid min al-kalami, ya ikhwani huwa, the 
the, the, the point here is, if we considered correctly the issue of the hijama, no one would be sitting here and he never did hijama. No one would be sitting here and the last time he did hijama, he doesn't remember. This hijam is an issue that is seriously beneficial and it's important. And again, we want to be Ahl Sunnah, we want to be Ahl Hadith, we want to be on a Salafiyah, and part of that requires that we say that with our mouths. But even more important than that is the actions, the actions. Al Af'al ablagu min al Aqwal. Actions speak louder than words, they're more dynamic. So if we're from Ahl Sunnah, not from the people of innovation, then where is the iqbal and where is connecting ourselves to the sunnah? There's an issue that our kids, even as young as this boy, our children, there's something that fathers collectively, we say, hey, we're going to go get hijama. We got eight, nine, ten of our boys. But you'll find the lady, Ahlul Sunnah, she has niqab, she has gloves, all that. Mashallah, husband to Ahlul Sunnah. But when we say we're going to take little man Adam to get hijama, the mother says, no, it's blood, it's blood. I don't, I don't, I don't. Well, there's some blood that is mustahab in al-Islam, like the khitan, for an example. There's some blood. I don't want anybody to take my words out of context. You know these people, you know how they are. A person is born, he gets his khitan, he gets his circumcision. That particular blood, we're going to say, you know, I'm going to give the kid it. I'm not going to give him the circumcision because blood. No. He is directed and educated by his father and the elders of the community about turning towards loving the sunnah. So with that, Ikhwani, I wanted to bring this to your attention. As it relates to the issue of al-hijama, there is a hadith that there is some Munaza'in is, uh, some scholars say it's authentic, some say it's not authentic. And that is that the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khayru Yawmin Tahtajibuna Fihi. The best day that you can do the hijama is that you do it on the 17th, or you do it on the 19th, or you do it on the 21st. And Imam Ahmed said, nothing is authentic as it relates to the tahdeed of the yawm. You do it any day. But other scholars said that this hadith was authentic, that it is Hassan, inshallah, and it's authentic. And from them is the latter day Sheikh Al Albani. Although Al Imam Ahmed and those people were greater than Al Albani, the point is that the issue has ikhtilaf. I'm not going to put a lot of emphasis on this day or that day because it's hard to come to a conclusion for me. What is it? Is it authentic, not authentic? I just want you to know. Some of the ulama of Islam, they said, it's not authentic. Anything about the specific day. So therefore, do the hijama whenever you can do the hijama. The important thing is that you do it. The other issue is, we have some people who are the hajim. He's the person who's doing the hijama. And you guys, if you make this your vocation, you'll be doing a very serious aspect of the sunnah and you'll be benefiting the community. So someone who doesn't have a job, why don't you become a hajim? Why don't you become a person who learns how to do hijama? It's better than taking money from the welfare. It's better than asking the masjid for sadaqah. It's better than being broke. But anyway, as it relates to taking money from the hijama, I want to say this. That the ulama have ikhtilaf as to whether or not it's permissible. Some of the ulama said it's not permissible for the hajim to take money at all. And that's because you're taking money for blood. Blood shouldn't cost money. You shouldn't sell blood and you shouldn't buy blood. So it's something that is dani, something low. Ihana, muhin, muhan. Leave that thing alone. Some of the ulama said that it is haram for the person who's free because the free person, hur, this is a bad thing for him to do. Take money for blood. And it's halal if a person is an abd because he may need it. He may need it. And this is what happened with the Prophet Sallallahu Abdullah ibn Abbasin, he had a number of slaves who used to do the hijama for Ibn Abbas, his family, 
and for the household of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So they would give him something. Because he was a slave, so the scholars made that distinction. And the jamhur, or the majority of the ulama, they said that it's permissible to take money, but that the person should not say, but give me 10 pounds, 20 pounds. And unfortunately, the hijama is 30 pounds, 50 pounds. And anyone who is a hajim, we're going to say, hey, that's a lot of money. You stop the people from doing this sunnah because 40, 50 pounds is a lot of money. 10 pounds, 15 pounds a cup. 15 pounds, 20 pounds a cup. You can give the community a break because if you lower that money, more people will come to you. Plus, keep it in mind, some of the ulama say you shouldn't even take money for it because of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In an authentic hadith, he said, "Sharrul kasb, mahrul baghi, wa thamin al kalb, wa kasb al hajjam." The worst money that you can get is the money that is paid to a prostitute. Akramakumullah. The worst money, worst salary. Whether she's taking it, her pimp is taking it, the one who's paying it, terrible. Number two, to pay for a dog. In Al Islam, we don't buy dogs. In the Muslim world, you don't buy and sell dogs. Man, catch a dog, he train him, and then he lets that dog help him to take care of his animals. Catch a dog, he train him, he takes that dog, lets that dog become his hottest for his house, watching his house. As for, I'm um, selling dogs, buying dogs? No, this is a bad thing with the people in the past. But right now, buying and selling dogs, uh, fighting dogs, I mean, it's a lot of money. Dogs is a lot of money. So the prophet said, the worst, the worst, sharru kesp, the worst money is paying for a dog. So he also mentions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the blood of the hijama, taking money for the hijama. It's the worst, worst thing. He mentions, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, kasbul hajjam khabith. He said, getting money for that blood is dirty, it's filthy. So because of these two ahadith and other than them, those ulama of Islam said it's haram. So if a person is a hajim, and he takes the position of the jamhur, the majority of the ulama, okay, for bihi wa ni'ma. Because as I told you, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave that man some money because he did hijama for him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, therefore, it shows that it's not haram, but it may be something that's disliked, a tanzih, because you have those other ahadith. But we want to say to the people who are doing this hijama that they shouldn't take advantage of the community to that degree. Many people want to do the hijama. It's like the honey as well. You bring this much honey back, real honey, real honey from Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan. You bring real honey, this may cost 500 pounds, 300 pounds. Are you serious, 300 pounds? What did you have to do to get the honey? Did you have to go through a billion bees and you put your life on the line and you was hanging from a cliff and you cut off the thing and you brought the honey? No, you just went and got the honey. You brought it and now you're taking advantage of the people. It's like people who perform hajj and umrah. When you're out in the desert, Muzdali for Arafat, someone comes and they know there are no refrigerators, whatever, people need water, and you guys, you need water. He's gonna sell this to you for 10 pounds, one bottle for 10 pounds. And you're forced to buy it because of the circumstances. And those kind of issues, the istighlal and taking advantage of Muslims is something that is when I came, I saw the scaffolding over the other clock. They fixing that one, huh? What a pass, huh? MashaAllah. Okay, I got it, I got it. I'm done, I'm done. So the point here, Khwani, is we encourage people who are doing hijama to give the community a break. And I'm also encouraging some of you young brothers because I know of your financial situation, some of you. You're going to the university, you're going to the college, and you need some extra income. Then be a person of the sunnah and learn this art because it's not that complicated. Now, of course, Got to learn what you're doing, which brings me to the last point. 
as it relates to the hijama, the person who's going to do it, have it done to him, there are some basic things you need to know. Some of them are from common sense, and some of them come from experience. For an example, when you go for the hijama, it's fundamental, man, that if you see a guy and his hands are dirty and everything is dirty around him, then you're not going to do that hijama with a person whose hygiene is compromised. We know that the very first thing that you do for the child when the child is born is you make a tahnik. You take the dates and you chew it. Anything sweet, you give it to the baby. That's the sunnah, and we all did it, alhamdulillah. Now, the companion, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, he brought his baby to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa his son. Rasulullah took the tamar, sallallahu alayhi wa he chewed it, gave it to the baby, and the baby ate it, he enjoyed it. He named him Ibrahim, and then he made dua for him. So it's from the sunnah, if you have a baby, take your child to your sheikh, take your child to the alim, to someone who you respect, your father, your uncle, someone who has a position with you. And you tell him, you do the tahnik for me, make dua for him, give him the name as well. Okay, now when you go to that person, you see him coughing. <laughs> He's coughing. And snot's coming out of his nose. Makamasi, coming out of his nose. And he's carrying on. You're going you're gonna to say, okay, do the sunnah for me? No, you're not going to say, do the sunnah for me. You're going to say to him, Shafaqallah, anta muskoom. Anta muskoom. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you're going to say. So you got to have common sense. In dealing with the issue of the hijama, you shouldn't do the hijama... Uh, you shouldn't do the hijama while you are while 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 you are like suffering from any respiratory problems, any problems with your throat, because from experience, the hajim, they've come to know that this hijama it will help the joints, it helps arthritis, it helps blood circulation, it helps a lot of things, a lot of things. But there are certain things you gotta avoid. If you are an individual who needs, like, you, you, you gave some blood, you had a blood transfusion, you donated blood, for an example, don't do the hijama right away after that. Don't do the hijama right away after that. There are a number of things, Ikhwani, you can just find those things very easily on the internet. All I'm telling you is, some of the stuff is just common sense, and some of the stuff comes as a result of the knowledge and the experience of the hajim. So I just wanted to remind you of this issue. Perchance, perhaps, you guys would do it. You'd be in, motivated, encouraged, inspired to do this particular sunnah, inshallah ta'ala. And also, as an advice to our shabab, that, hey, man, you can get a job doing this thing. And you can make extra money doing this. Just learn how to do it. Just learn how to do it. So just for my own information, how many of you have done hijama here? How many of you did hijama before? MashaAllah. How many of you never did hijama? Oh, MashaAllah. Those of you who didn't do the hijama, I hope and pray that uh, you take these words and you do the hijama. The hijama can help you to do better on your exam, cleans up your mind, makes you more awake. If you have an issue that's going on, headaches, hijama is very good for migraines and headaches. Very good for that. You get in the back of your neck here and the top of your head. As a matter of fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith said, if someone complained about a headache, anything in the head, he would tell him do hijama. Anyone complained about anything doing the feet, a sore, anything on the feet, he told him put henna on it. Henna. This is from the medicinal issue. Rasulullah would never get a cut, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, except that he put henna on it. So some of us think, that the hen is just for the nisa, you know, and it's just for zafat, zafat. It's just for the uh, hafla and the nikah. It's for that. Beautify yourself, no problem. Zafaran, henna, no problem. But henna has medicinal value, medicinal value. Good for your beard, good for cuts and sores, and so forth and so on. He even, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if someone had a cut, he would take the dirt of the earth and put it on me as well. So he brought us a religion, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, and coming from his environment, where they used to have that, uh, what they call it, sha'bi, the uh, atib al-sha'bi, you know, 
um, I don't know, how would you translate that? Local, local medicines. Like if you go to Pakistan, if you go to India, if you go to Africa, there are things that people do where they don't go to the hospital. We ain't going to the hospital for everything that happens. Yeah, you're not going to go to the hospital for everything that happens, especially where we come from. And that's why, alhamdulillah, we grow up tough, alhamdulillah, in a, in a good way. Person break his arm, break his leg or something like that, and they tie something out and you just keep going. I don't condone that, I don't endorse it, but our condition is like that. So we come with that tip as shabi, the local medicines to help us with our situation. And this particular issue that we're talking about is from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam, the environment, the time that he lived in, the people were doing that. And although that is the case, we're not going to say that the hijab is outdated. We're not going to say that. He brought us a religion. The fly in one wing is the disease and the other wing is the good. Everything we need to know. Everything that we need to know. So inshallah, Azza wa Jalla, open up the floor for any questions that you brothers may have right now. Akramakumullah wa barakallah fikum. Naam, akhi Ibrahim. Where at? Where? And it's free or it costs money? How much does it cost 400 to learn? How long is the course? How much does it cost to get the hijab? I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Fadli Akhi Abdul Hay. Good question, Akhi Abdul Hay. There's ikhtilaf between the ulama of Islam concerning doing hijama in the month while you're fasting, whether it's Ramadan or not. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man ihtajama faqad aftara. Anyone who does hijama while he's fasting, he broke his fast. And this was the ruling at the beginning of Al Islam. That was the ruling at the beginning. But then it was abrogated by the Prophet Sallallahu So the hukum became mansukh because he himself in the month of Ramadan did hijama and everybody saw it. And he didn't say to the people, this is especially for me. And the companions after him did hijama in the month of Ramadan, radiallahu anhum. So you may read in the books of fiqh, every time Ramadan comes, especially with the masajid that are not really keen on the fiqh of the kitab and the sunnah. They're on the fiqh of the madhhab. That's it, fiqh of the madhhab. So if you smell smoke, it breaks your fast. It's no delil that smelling smoke breaks your fast. If you bleed, it breaks your fast. Although the companions used to fast and they had wounds. And there's no delil to show that bleeding breaks your fast. If you taste the food without swallowing it, it breaks your fast. They come up with all that stuff. Start the fast 45 minutes, an hour, ihtiyatan, before the actual adhan. That's the fiqh of the madhab. And may Allah bless the ulama of the madhab, all of them. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give more blessings upon the ulama who brought us the fiqh of the kitab and the sunnah. So if you read that, doing the hijab in Ramadan breaks your fast, it was the case at the beginning. But then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam abrogated that so it doesn't break your fast. You can do hijama. Fadli Akhi. Bismillah. Can we go to non-Muslims in order to perform hijama? Allahumma naam. You can go to non-Muslims to deal with them in your life and in your dunya and even in your deen as long as there's no delil to stop you from doing that. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he needed some food. So what did he do? He took his weapons of war and he made them marhuna. He gave them to a Yahudi. He said, here, keep these weapons of war. I need to borrow from you some food and I'll pay you back when I get the money and I'll take my weapons from you as well. And he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his stuff was with that man. So that was cooperation between him and a non-Muslim. So there's nothing in the deen that says the person who is the hajim, he has to be a Muslim. No, he has to be muqtan, he has to know what he's doing, he has to be mahir, he knows what he's doing. So if the Chinese person knows what he's doing, no problem, no problem. Uh, the little girl, because the hadith said that the ghulam, he is held ransom. Is that applicable to the little girl as well? Allahumma na'am. It's applicable to the girl. The fact that the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-ghulam, he said that, this kalima, kharajat makhraj al-ghalib. Makhraj al-ghalib. It's like the religion, Ya ladina amanu. So it's talking to the, the core, to the men, but it includes the women. So when it said that the boy, he is um, captive until the aqiq is done, the girl as well. And that's why the girl gets one sheep and the boy gets two. And it's the haq for both of them. And as we mentioned a number of times, the qa'ida. Uh, in the deen, the principle is, as he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and nisa'u shaqa'iqur rijal. The women are just like the men, the twins. Everything that applies to the men applies to them, except where the deen makes a distinction. So she doesn't pray when she's bleeding. She can't be the imam in the religion. If the imam makes a mistake, the men say, subhanallah, and the women clap. So there are distinctions. If she prays with the women, she prays in the middle. She can't be the mu'adhin. So many ahkam that are special for them. Special for them. She needs a wali. The man doesn't need a wali. So everything else. She has to fast the way we fast. Pray the way we pray. Make hajj the way we make hajj. Umrah the way we make umrah. When you're from Safa and then Marwa and you run between that place, she should also run. She should also run. Provide it. Provide it. She doesn't compromise her ifa. Because the one who started that sunnah was a lady anyway. Hajar. Radiallahu anha. So if she ran, why well, this lady can't run? But if there are a lot of people and it's not appropriate, we're not going to tell the sister to go ahead and run. But if she's there by herself, there's not a lot of people there and so forth and so on. She's with her husband, her brother, and, and they're around her. She can run. No problem. And Allah is a'la and a'la. Any more questions? Tafadri Ahi. Say it again. The exact place. Uh, I remember an Imam. I, I, I will have to send it to you. Where is that? I will have to send it to you exactly where is that. What's the dua for when you're sick? Allahumma Rabbi Naz. Ishfi. What is it? Allahumma rabbin naz, idhhab al-ba's, washfi, anta shafi, la shifa'u illa shifa'uka, shifa'un la yugadiru saqama. Hakatha, huh? Bismillah. Okay, Ikhwani, again, I want to apologize to all of you guys. Tfaddal. Now, if the person did not take the hair off of the girl because alhamdulillah people from Pakistan, people from Afghanistan, they don't have any problem with cutting the baby's hair off. Some people in Africa, we don't have any problem with cutting the baby, the baby girl's hair off. But some people have a problem with that because the hair of the girl is a part of her beauty so they don't want to take the hair off. But as we said, these rulings are applicable. The khitan, circumcision for the boy, circumcision for the girl. In the sunnah. But I'm not advising you to circumcise your daughters because it's against the law here. 
because the Muslims went overboard in the, what they did and they mutilated their girls and it's haram. So if your daughter's about to go overseas to one of these East African countries, for an example, they may stop you at the airport and check your daughter, ask questions. So I'm not telling you to do the circumcision for the girl, but it's from the sunnah, from the sunnah. But it's applicable to both. That's the point here. So if the person didn't cut the hair of the daughter when she was small, he didn't know, whatever, and it grew later on, yeah, inshallah, you should cut it. But Allahu alam. Allahu alam. I, I wouldn't be too shadeed on that. Allahu alam. Someone may say, well, I didn't cut the hair of my daughter. I never cut it. I never cut the hair of my daughter. And the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that it's a hurt, it's a harm. So this is a proof. I never cut it. So look, it, it shows that this kalam is not true. It's not true. Maybe the fact you didn't cut her hair is the reason why she's wilding out like that. The fact that you didn't cut her hair, part of that could be, one of, maybe that's one of the reasons she's disobedient to you. Maybe one of, that's one of the reasons why she's not practicing the deen. Don't use your aql like that. Prophet Muhammad said it's an other, it's a hurt, it's a harm. Whether we see it, we don't see it. Medical people see it, don't see it. It's irrelevant. Irrelevant, irrelevant. So we're going to stop here. Inshallah, I want to apologize once again to Khwani for missing all of those classes, but I was traveling. And um, the other thing is, coming here from where I'm living at, coming here, it'll get me here at like uh, 725, 720, if I catch that train all the time. So I, I got here and I missed one rock out. So if I'm ever late or something, I'm going to be in touch with Nur al-Din, inshallah, in touch with you guys to let you know, yeah, I'm on my way, okay? Bi-idhni Allah. Barakallah fikum wa ahsan Allah ilaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.